actually started the modern day Sankirtan movement or enacted it based on the vision of his father, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, whom Srila Bhaktisiddhanta considered to be his Shiksha guru. He didn't call him father as some of his other brothers did. He considered that to, to be too familiar because he revered him and considered him to be a, a liberated soul and his guru. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur had revived the mission of Srila Bhaktivinoda, of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu in such an imaginative way. And he had also been someone who was respected in society because not only was he a great Vaishnav, but also he was well established, highly accomplished actually in his profession as a judge, high court judge and manager of the Jagannath Puri temple for some time. Also he had a robust family that he managed quite well. And for those who are in the uh, Grahasta Ashram, a great hero in the sense that he showed an example that a Paramahamsa Vaishnav could be engaged in the world and at the same time spread the Krishna consciousness movement and be completely surrendered to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu all at the same time. And of course, his main desire was to see that, that is, I'm talking about Bhaktivinoda Thakur, that the teachings of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu not just be spread all over the world, but that people would be able to take them up. So he thought of ways and means to connect people to Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. He wrote a book about Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings and dis distributed it all over the world. Thoreau, Emerson received copies, other great uh, scholars and thinkers in the world. And you know that Bhaktivinoda Thakur, of course, set up the Namhata. It was a very elaborate marketplace so that people everywhere could have a responsible position in the Sankirtan movement, take an empowered role and then network to spread it all over. First of all, India, and he had designs on spreading it all over the world. And he envisioned a way that people would come from everywhere in the world. Isn't that amazing? That Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur was such a visionary that he saw that there in Mayapur, he uh, said, uh, the followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu from Europe, from Asia, from America would all come and dance and chant Jai Sachi Nandan. 1975, I was part of a kirtan party going down that, what was it, a little dirt road there at the time. And there were hundreds of devotees from around the world chanting Jai Sachi Nandan. The prescience of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And uh, he prayed. Prayer is powerful. We heard about that when we talked about Advaita Acharya and how he prayed for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And what did Bhaktivinoda Thakur pray for? I mean, what is he famous for praying for? And why would I be mentioning it on Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's? Vishnu. Yeah, can you say more about that? What is it, what he meant by a ray of Vishnu? So he wanted an empowered personality who would be able to carry forward the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And it, therefore he prayed for um, a, a, an empowered personality who would be a ray of Vishnu. Yeah, we saw Advaita Acharya do it. We saw Bhaktivinoda Thakur do it. And what happened? I mean, in the case of Vaitacharya, Lord Chaitanya advented and started the Sankirtan movement. In the case of Bhaktivinoda Thakur, the answer to his prayers was Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur, Bhimala Prasad. And at the 
uh, time of his birth, it is said that uh, Bhimala Prasad's umbilical cord was wrapped around his uh, shoulder, just like a Brahmin's thread. And then the Rathayatra cart stopped outside Bhaktivinoda Thakur's house. His wife brought out Bhimal Prasad and a garland fell down uh, to the child uh, from Jagannath himself. So there were auspicious signs and obviously the purpose of having children for Bhaktivinoda Thakur was to um, not just make them Krishna conscious, but he wanted Krishna conscious Ashaktivesh avatars to appear and help spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. That kind of a family is uh, rare to achieve and uh, Krishna arranges for such personalities as Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur to appear in the homes of great Paramahamsas like Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So in his early days, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Abhimal Prasad was noted for his scholarship. And in his uh, later days, he was known as the um, inimitable, inimitable, inimitable um, Vaishnav who was absorbed in bhajan for 10 years, he made a vow that he would sit in one place and chant 192 rounds every day, 300,000 names of the Lord. And his ultimate goal was a billion names. And so he stayed in a just a very simple hut that leaked when it rained. In the meantime, he wrote in between and just fully focused on chanting. And uh, from that uh, bhajan, he had a revelation from the Panchatattva that he should bring out the teachings of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to the world, which of course was in line with the desires of his father. And when both his guru, Maharaj, who received Diksha from Srila Gorkishore Das Babaji Maharaj and Bhakti Vinod Thakur had left the world. He was at a great crossroads and he took that appearance of the Panchatattva in his bhajan as the impetus to then fully take up the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as it had been envisioned by Bhakti Vinod Thakur. So uh, I want to bring it into sort of practical terms of how Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Uh, of course, Srila uh, Bhakti Siddhanta was also called Prabhupada, as we call Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada. Trivikram Maharaj tells about how once when he was Prabhupada's secretary and he was helped, they had just uh, gone into a new room, they were traveling, and Trivikram Maharaj was setting up uh, Srila Prabhupada's room. He had it always the same wherever he went. And there is a picture of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta that he always had with him and he kept on his desk. And Trivik Maharaj was wondering where to put the picture. There were a couple of choices of places. And his guru said, put Prabhupada over there. And Trivik Maharaj then realized, oh, Yes, he has his Prabhupada. <laughs> so the, the name Prabhupada, uh, the master at whose feet other Prabhus sit, um, was the title of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And he had a, a very uh, defined way of uh, presenting Krishna consciousness, or his mood was uh, is discernible, and I want to look tonight in through a few passages uh, that were spoken or written by Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur to see if we can identify ways in which his uh, moods and methods have 
uh, <clears throat> affected us, how, how we may or may not be living according to his ideals in uh, spreading Krishna consciousness and practicing Krishna consciousness. Does that sound like something that you'd like to try? Okay. First, before we do that, however, I'll sing one of uh, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta's favorite bhajans. By the way, uh, his favorite um, author of bhajans was his father, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. And one of his favorite bhajans starts with Bajare Bajare Amar. It's a song about remembering the great Vaishnavas and remembering the holy places. So let's remember Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. It's his favorite song and enter into the mood of that by singing it ourselves. Bajare Bajare Ama Manati Manda You can give me a starting point. Go ahead, Monty. That sounds fine. Bajare Bajare Ama Manati Manda Bajan bina gati na yire. Baja baja bane Radha Krishna charana ravinda baja. Murari Mukunda 
Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare
Bhagavad Gita, can you hear me? <laughs> In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna mentions at the end of, in fact, he more than mentions, he emphatically says that one who's teaching his devotees, the message of the Bhagavad Gita is more, most dear to him. No one will ever be as dear to him as such a person. The Srimad Bhagavatam mentions that there are three categories of devotees. Acharya meva hare pujam nyasharye hate atad shu sabakta prakrita smitaha acharya meva hare the person uh, who is very exalted elevated the kanishta adhikari uh, has uh, come to the point of worshiping the form of the lord it's a very important stage of uh, coming to understand that the Supreme Personality of God, it has a personal form, is non different from the deity. That person is absorbed there. Their faith, and it must be nurtured there in uh, worshiping the deity. However, they don't see the devotee. They don't understand the 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 fact that the, the deity manifests because of what's in the heart of a devotee when a pure devotee comes. And... And requests. As the temple turns. When the devotee, pure devotee comes and requests the Lord to appear, he... Uh, comes on uh, on the request of the pure devotee. Um, <clears throat> so we can't see Krishna without the devotees, but in the beginning, uh, <clears throat> beginning stages, the neophyte devotee doesn't understand the value of association with Vaishnavas, which is the root cause of devotional service. It's the root cause of advancement in devotional service. It's the root cause of coming to the perfection in devotional service. And that person doesn't also know how to do good for others or have the impetus to do good for others by spreading Krishna consciousness. So bhakta prakrita smitaha. And then after some time when the devotee is more advanced and comes to the middle stage, the madhyama adhikari, stage, then he's described, she's described as being able to see various entities and to act uh, appropriately with them. Ishvare taradine shu balishe shu du satsucha prema maitri krupo peksha ya karoti samadhyamaha. The Madhyama Adhikari sees Ishvara Krishna and worships, gives all his love her love. Then also knows notices the devotees and how exalted they are and uh, makes appropriate friendships with the devotees and then sees the innocent and gives as much mercy as possible. That's the preoccupation of the Madhyama Adhikari is giving mercy to the conditioned souls knowing that maya mugda jivaranahi sota krishna gyan there's no way that they can come out of their entrancement in maya which is like uh, an addiction that's gone um, too far the living entity out of curiosity becomes dabbles in the material energy and then becomes tra- uh, captured and devoured and then cannot become free on, can't come free on on its own and it's not swata, it doesn't come out of it uh, without outside help. It has to get mercy. So Krishna empowers the Madhyama Adhikaris to do this work and to uh, give mercy to, this, to the souls of the world. The prayers personified Vedas say that this is the most glorious pastime of the Lord, is saving the souls from the material world. And if somebody can be part of that, then how uh, dear are they to Krishna? And so this is advanced devotional service. 
is troubling oneself for the sake of others to help them. Tapyante lokatapena sarava presojana parama aradanam tadi purushasya akilatmana. Shukadev Goswami says that Lord Shiva has this mood, therefore he's the greatest Vaishnav. He has the mood that, okay, I'll drink the poison to save the universe, whatever sacrifice I have to make. I'll do that. His emblem is the blue throat. He swallowed it, held it in his throat. And then, of course, the Madhyama Adhikar knows how to um, artfully disengage from those who are envious so as not to make them more inimical. And then uh, prays for them in hopes that uh, there's a way that in the future they can take to Krishna consciousness. So, of course, there are mixtures of different kinds of, of Vaishnavs. But the Vaishnavs who are um, empowered by the Supreme Personality of God and the Acharyas come to the world and establish the ways and means that hundreds, thousands, and millions of people, of souls, can come to Krishna consciousness. And they do that in various ways by, typically, by, of course, teaching. And uh, much of that is in writing and uh, setting an example. Also, sometimes building, like Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur did in India, mutts. A mutt is a place where you can go and uh, fully culture Krishna consciousness. He provided facility for thousands of young men and women. He had uh, his Vishnu Priya ashrams so that women could come also and be fully engaged in sadhana and preaching as well. So uh, that's the, the work of the most advanced souls. Jiva Goswami very strongly says that if one is performing devotional service, but is neglecting to give mercy to others and doesn't see that Krishna is in everyone's heart and the best way of worshiping him is to give mercy to others. Such a person is doing yagya by pouring ghee upon ashes. As if the fire has gone out and there's no uh, tangible result. So, the point here is that the most exaltative moods of the Vaishnavas is to uh, save others. Of course, the principle always holds that one must save oneself as well. Otherwise, how will one uh, effectively help others? So both things have to be there. And in uh, the life and teachings of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, we can take from various statements, which I'm about to do now, just to give a flavor for the way he taught and what his mood was. So this is, um, I'm reading excerpts from the Sri Bhakti Siddhanta Vaibhava uh, that uh, Bhakti Vikas Maharaj uh, put together. And first uh, excerpt I'm reading from. In a lecture of 1932, Srila Saraswati Thakur stated how some disciples considered that by his spending profusely on preaching programs and printing, he was embezzling their hard-earned collections. He mentioned by name a particular leading devotee as one of several who thought it better to keep those funds in the bank. But, he continued, my aim is not to make provisions and lay bricks for rascals who will come in the future. Possibly the structures already made will one day become dens of ganja and vice. He further commented that some of his men had voiced the opinion that now there were enough books and magazines, so all printing activities should be scrapped. There was no need for further hard work, for by showing the deity and receiving collections, the Matbasis could live happily. So what particularly caught my attention 
was the, the a tenor of this statement, which we perceived in our Srila Prabhupada when he started the Sankirtan movement. And he writes that I didn't come to establish temples, but I came to preach Krishna consciousness. Of course, establishing temples and all kinds of structure and management is necessary, but it's necessary to manage the results of preaching and not independently. As if you try to establish a, a management system or even lay bricks without having a forward thrust into the world to establish Krishna consciousness through going door to door, town to town, doing Harinam, Harikata, and uh, profusely distributing books, then you have nothing to manage except for a bunch of problems. And uh, you're managing on a plateau. There's no real reason to manage. Plenty of uh, other companies are worried about management and are struggling hard with the, all the problems that come along with managing people and projects. And ultimately, they're of little or no avail because they don't do anything to advance the human spirit. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta's mood, again, was my aim is not to make provisions and lay bricks for rascals who will come in the future. So um, that uh, mood can always uh, creep in into an individual's life or into the life of an organization and that is that um, let's get comfortable. And as soon as I want to get comfortable at the expense of the Sankirtan movement or by living a, a life in the mode of goodness, then my advancement stops. So having the stimulation of fresh challenges to meet in expanding the Sankirtan movement, especially in bringing new people who are unacquainted, wholly unacquainted with Krishna consciousness into the fold is vitally important. And we've been seeing it recently with new people coming into our bhakti community rooms and the, the, the freshness is palpable. It uh, changes the atmosphere entirely when a new person who just uh, came, walked in out of the rain of the material world comes in and feels the warm environment inside the, the Zoom room where devotees are gathered to speak about Krishna and the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. And so that has to be on the forefront of the minds of those who are in the Sankirtan movement and that it is a movement meant to save the conditioned souls in the material world, not for finding uh, comfort or becoming uh, well-established uh, as, um, you know, in any material way. Furthermore, there's a way in which by using funds and resources, as we heard in this paragraph, uh, specifically for preaching, I mean, the mind can think, well, you know, why not put it all in a CD somewhere or <laughs> so we can get fat? Uh, there's a way that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur resisted this in all of his mutts. In fact, uh, elsewhere in this book, I didn't mark the, the citation, but he wanted that his uh, managers, when they got big donations, to spend them on festivals, book distribution, and so on, so that they didn't have that feeling that, okay, now we're good. And now we can cruise, and now we can cop a lean. Uh, I'm refrigerator's full. I've got enough money in the bank, nothing to worry about. I'm going to lean out the window, drive down the street, and just uh, enjoy my life here in the material world. But he liked the anxiety that, uh, where is the next thing going to come from? And isn't it that, hasn't the, our, over the last 10 years, the way we've, uh, more than 10 years now, it's 14 years since 
our first monthly Sankirtan festival. Every time we set a goal and say, okay, we have to do this, that's voluntary. We, we decide who, nobody made us do that. We just thought it up and did it to ourselves. We put ourselves in anxiety. Um, one of my friends criticizes me a lot. He said, all these self-imposed deadlines you're on all the time. And yeah, that's what we do. Uh, otherwise, if we don't do it, who's going to do it for us? So catching the mood of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur that, yeah, make self-imposed deadlines so that you're not getting fat. You're not sitting back and thinking, life is good, I'm happy. Everybody else can go to hell because I got what I need and uh, I'm, I'm okay. We should feel anxiety and be paradhukaduki, suffer because of the suffering of others. That's the mood of the acharyas and that's the mood to catch up. I'm gonna read another excerpt before I open the room for uh, comments. The next one, I'll, I'll read two more. The next one uh, I thought was a very interesting one, which goes to the utilitarian nature of Srila Bhaktisiddhanta's teachings, for that matter, of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings, which is Anasakta Sevishayan Yatarham Upayunjita Nirbanda Krishna Sambande Yuktam Vairagya Muchite Prapanchikataya Buddha Hari Sambandi Vastuna Mamukshabi Prityago Vairagyam Palukukatyate means that everything should be used in the service of the Supreme Personality of God. And if you leave something behind that could have been used, this is false renunciation. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur has a very interesting logo for his Gaudiya Mat. On it, you'll find various iconic um, images. And one of them, well, the, the the logo is divided into two parts. One part is the Vaidhi Marg, and on the other, the, the path of devotional service and rules and regulations. The other is the Rog Marg. And guess what he puts over on the side of the Rog Marg? He puts the printing press. Just under the printing press, there's there's a Madunga, and then the printing press and some cartels. And as uh, you'll read from the history of the Gaudiya Mat, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur kept his uh, devotees busy all the time. They're always busy. Uh, 20, uh, you know, every waking hour, they were doing some kind of service. He didn't want them uh, sleeping. But Prabhupada also, when he established ashrams, he said, these are not free hotels for lazy fellows to come and sleep, not free hotels. There are places where the devotees would, would come who, who have that spirit. And Srila Bhakti Sananta says, those who have life, they will preach. They will go out and preach. And so everything is meant to be engaged in the Sankirtan movement. And here is the citation. This particularly about ashram and sannyas. He writes, Srila Saraswati Thakur downplayed the fuss over introduction of sannyas by putting in pers into perspective the Vaishnav school does not attach much importance to this external formality of ascetic order, but considers it merely an ostentatious advantage for preaching work. Thus, although to facilitate his devotional service, a devotee may assume any situation within Varna and Ashrama, he identifies, identifies himself as the servant of Vishnu and the Vaishnavas and not with any temporal position. So of course, you know, Gaudiya Vaishnavism went through many transformations after Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left the world and various uh, deviant groups grew over time by misinterpreting his teachings and 
there are um, uh, in these various groups, many uh, imitated uh, Rupa Goswami, Sanatana Goswami. Of course, Vaishnavs before Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur in his line would um, to show their renunciation, fall in the footsteps of Rupa Goswami, put on white as uh, Babaji's. And uh, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur reversed that trend and introduced the Daivi Varnashram and the Sannyas. So for those uh, who were to come into the full order of engagement in Mahaprabhu's service, he would give them sannyas. And this meant holding the tree dhanna, body, mind, speech, and soul, because there's actually four poles inside that thing, uh, engaged constantly in the service of the Lord. So just as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu took sannyas because he wanted to bring people closer. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur himself took sannyas and also had his followers take sannyas as well so that uh, they could be fully engaged in preaching. And it's not, it wasn't uh, important unto itself other than its utilitarian nature. And we, we find this in uh, our Srila Prabhupada's teachings. In fact, there was a controversy early on in, the, in our Sankirtan movement about uh, wearing different kinds of clothes. And it occurred in the early 70s when one of the Sankirtan leaders and temple president had found that when devotees went around to distribute books, they were noticeable wearing dhotis and saris, <laughs> to say the least. If they walk in, you walk in a mall in a dhoti, people definitely notice you. So he had them go to the Salvation Army and get outfitted with uh, regular clothes that fit in with everybody else. And when they started wearing those clothes around, they would stay out longer stay in longer in, in all the different places that they went. And um, somebody complained. Actually, one of our leaders complained and wrote a letter to Prabhupada said that the devotees were going back to being hippies because they were wearing these different kinds of clothes. And Prabhupada said, oh, stop them then. But then the leader of the party wrote to Prabhupada said, but Prabhupada, we're doing this as a utilitarian measure in order to distribute more books. And then Prabhupada said, tell them they can wear the clothes. And he wrote a purport about it. Uh, you know, when Prabhupada put it, in, in, immortalized it in his, in his purport by saying that devotees do this in order to spread the Sankirtan movement for the sake of preaching. It's utilitarian. You can wear uh, whatever gets the job done. And in fact, that's what Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did. So we find this in the mood of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. His mood about sannyas was that it's it's not um, it's not a it's an external formality. Gopi Bhartu Padakamali or Das Das Anudasaha. we we don't identify with these Varnashrama uh, statures, other than to um, utilize them for expanding the preaching of Krishna consciousness and uh, having facility to dedicate ourselves appropriately at every stage of life, whatever, whatever ashram we are in. Okay, one more at page 216. And this is the way in which Srila Bhakti Siddhanta instructed his Matbasis, that means those who lived in an ashram. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati's general instruction to Matbasis was to daily go for bhiksha for a minimum of half an hour and visit at least five houses. He would say, go and repeat the message of Krishna and while speaking, also hear it yourself and thus become purified. 
Even if no one gives anything, at least people will see you and be reminded of our mission. But devotees with specialized engagements, particularly deity service, cooking, or publication work were not required to go out. Srila Saraswati Thakur did not underplay the challenges of preaching. He likened dissemination of Lord Chaitanya's mercy to free distribution of first-class mangoes, which would find few willing takers and more likely, invi and more likely invite suspicion and skepticism. He said that the genuine speaker of Harikata will certainly be severely mistreated by materialists and sometimes even by demigods. Nor did he uphold the artificial distinction generally made by Vaishnavs between bhajan and prachar. Rather, he stated that prachar is the natural kirtan of siddhas and is essential to the sadhana of sadhakas. Bhuktishirishan is high sadhana. Because if we enjoy nice fruit but don't desire to share it with others, then our own stock will decrease. For seeing our stinginess, the original source will cut our supply. <laughs> He declared, Jivera viparita ruchi, parivartana karai, sarvapeka, dhayamoy ganera, ekmatra kartavya. The only duty of all merciful persons is to transform the contrary inclination of conditioned souls. I'll read that again. If you want to get a tattoo, it's short enough. The only duty of all merciful persons is to transform the contrary inclination of conditioned souls. That's full-time work. And that's our job. To effect this, he wanted to create Goshtyanandis, preachers who cooperate with Lord Chaitanya's mission for increasing the number of devotees. Period, full stop. So this is actually advanced devotional service sacrificing your peace of mind. And actually it's counterintuitive because we get real peace of mind when we do walk out of our comfort zone. It's only anxiety in the comfort zone. It's only an imagined comfort zone. And when we're in the service of Mahaprabhu by risking our peace of mind by going out, we actually get peace of mind. I guess that's a kind of paradox, I don't know. But that's what we were taught by our esteemed Acharya. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And Prabhupada taught us the exact same thing. Not only did he teach us by speaking, he did it himself. How much more uncomfortable can you get, supposedly, than to walk out of your home country with no facility and get on a boat as the only passenger of a freighter and come to a foreign land where there's really a, a zoo-like situation going on. The humans are, are acting in bizarre ways, especially contrary to the culture of Vrindavan or any kind of Vedic uh, culture. And then uh, your job is to be with them. Uh, you're the on their only guide and a hope in life. You take all that responsibility on your head what does that feel like? Well, Prabhupada expressed it by his ecstasies, which poured out of him. When, the, when one gives like that, then the supply becomes unlimited. Prabhupada had unlimited supply, unlimited supply of Krishna Kata and unlimited supply of energy to write books, to write letters, to manage, even as he was preaching from morning till night and then writing in the wee hours of the night. Krishna gave it to him because he gave. So this is what we get from our acharyas, is this mood of, if you want to be happy, then do high sadhana. And high sadhana means to organize your life in such a way that you have the wherewithal, you fortify yourself sufficiently and edify yourself sufficiently so that you can then give others the opportunity to take to Krishna consciousness. And if you can do that, you're following the, mo the mood and the footsteps of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. I have a lot more, but let's take a few uh, reflections because I'd love to hear how this is uh, sitting with you. Hare Krishna. 
Hare Krishna. Oh, Madhava Govinda Prabhu, Hari Bo. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank you for the wonderful class. I just had a question um, with respect to what you were just mentioning about uh, the life of Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur, about how he encouraged every one of us to uh, be messengers of sharing the Krishna consciousness. How do we create, get a balance? We also he see in Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur's life itself that he spent uh, 10 years of his life uh, doing bhajan in Mayapur, uh, chanting one billion names. Uh, so how do we understand both of these things uh, and apply it in our life? There's a time every day when you should take full advantage. It's called Brahma Muhurta. So you don't have to wait for, for a 10 year period to open up. Just wait for an hour and 40 minute period to open up every day. If you organize your life around this, that I take full advantage of that hour and 40 minutes every day, then uh, you're applying the principle. Then there's a time every month, two times, Akadashi. Organize a work for Akadashi, wait for Akadashi, fully lean into it if you can. If you can't, pick some holy days because there are, I think, more holy days in Gaudiya Vaishnavism than maybe in any other religion in the world. <laughs> then lean into those as much as possible. You know, we started that tradition at ISV many years ago when we were in that tiny little place, that little um, oven we used to have uh, Janmashtami in. And, uh, you know, we'd all come down there early in the morning at Mangal Artik, and then we'd stay until midnight and we never stopped hearing and chanting. You walk out of one of those and you're, you're an improved person. And then there's a time every year when you could take full advantage, Kartik. Take the month off, tell your boss I ain't working, too bad for you. Find somebody else if you don't like it. Uh, and uh, find a place where you can sit down and hear Bhagavatam all day long for a month, 30 days. And when you walk out of there, you'll be a different person, improved. And if we do these things daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, then we'll develop an acumen for doing a 10 year stint when the time is right. And otherwise, you can't, nobody can sit for that long. Prabhupada uh, engaged us in preaching and said, you know, later on you can, you can do. Because can you do it? I mean, let's see you try to, to put in a 10-year period of hearing and chanting. Generally, the mind uh, will go hearing and chanting for some time and they'll go, yeah, but what about, you know, isn't Pakistan playing... India and the cricket match. There's some some scars in there that take a while to um, become purified until we just uh, we have a taste actually for hearing Krishna Kata and chanting Hare Krishna, and that means we should steadily engage throughout the various periods of our life, even as we're working. And uh, you know you can even start with karma yoga. Uh, the process is so powerful. You know, if you can't, if you can't do that, Krishna says, then do something else that you can do, like work for me. If you can't do that, then just try to be charitably disposed, but start start somewhere. And by the mercy, it comes down to us as mercy to get such taste. If we can serve the, the great Vaishnavas, fulfill their desire, they'll bless us. That, okay, now you can hear something. And now you can chant a little bit. And uh, it comes down to our mercy. You see people all the time, you know, they're very eager for Krishna consciousness, but they can't chant more than one round. So I just can't, I don't have time. It's not time, it's taste. Everything's taste. So everyone has the same amount of time. 
So it doesn't make sense. I don't have time. But they chant one round and they pray and they get association. And they listen to classes. And then next time you see them, they say, I'm chanting four rounds. And they keep praying and serving. And next thing they say, God, I'm chanting eight rounds. And then one day, one fine day, they just say, I'm chanting 16 rounds and I'll never stop. How did that happen? It happens by the descent of grace that comes from service. So Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur engaged his devotees 24 hours in all kinds of services. He told them to chant 64 rounds, but they really didn't have time. But he kind of equated this uh, constant seva with, <laughs> with the chanting as well. It's not different. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, uh, when, um, about the, that peace of mind which you said that when you go out of, you know, uh, uh, out of your comfortability and when you go out and you get that peace of mind, but while sitting you don't get so I have, uh, you know, a realization that when there was COVID and we were not going out uh, distributing books, then I was feeling very dissatisfied. And even when I was going out, I used out alone. I used to get these hibis, hibis, and no inner nervousness when uh, I used to go out alone for books. Um, but after I, on that days, um, I. I mean, it was book distribution was good, uh, and uh, after that, I used to feel a uh, huge satisfaction. And uh, you know, um, at that time, I used to get the questions like, "Why am I doing this? Why am I doing this?" And then that used to, you know, build my faith more. I used to answer, "Why am I doing this?" You know, um, and um, then um, I mean, every it's like new challenges, uh, which uh, which uh, which. Uh, you know, um, which I feel uh, because of which I uh, feel I get satisfaction and I am advancing, um, and also like inviting new people's uh, uh, people and you know talking to them. Also, uh, I never used to do it, but uh, after um, after this bhakti community and uh, things, I I used to ask them. Otherwise, I used to just give them books and you know say them okay, that's it, and take the donation. But now, you know, you have to talk more, you have to engage, you know, you, you have to <clears throat> get uh, talk and uh, converse with them and uh, bring them. I mean, it's, uh, it's a new challenge. And then I feel, yeah, it's, it's really, uh, you know, that's, uh, that afterwards gives the peace of mind and satisfaction. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I'm going to read a, a section here that I think relates to what you just said. I picked it out earlier and Srila um, <clears throat> Bhakti Siddhanta Prabhupada writes, the mutt is the center of Hari Kirtan and Hari Kirtan is life and consciousness. To make sure there is no place for sloth, bad contact, trivial thought, gossip, gossip or vulgar desire at the mutt, you must go door to door where your Hari Kirtan will be tested by the public. They will think they are the givers and you are the receiver of alms. In other words, that their status is higher than yours and will criticize you in many ways, considering you objects of their mercy. Perhaps also some of them will be ready to kick you out. Then on one hand, you will be able to become trinad api sunicha, lower than straw, and mandana, manada, respectful to others. And on the other, you will take sincere care to make your lives and characters pure and exemplary. Besides, it will be beneficial for you that you are correct, that as you correct the mistakes of the common people by citing the message of Sadhu, Shastra, and Guru Varga, you yourselves will not commit those same mistakes. So, yeah, it's really powerful when you bring somebody. Like even now in the bhakti community, if you invite somebody to come on the call, you have to come. <laughs> That's something I've heard from various devotees. Um, it's like, yeah, I invited somebody. 
and if they come every Monday, now I have to come every Monday. And it's like, you know, people have kids and then the kid's like, okay, let's see you do it, daddy. You, know? <laughs> you have to follow. <laughs> Otherwise, why are they going to do it? So it's really important uh, sadhana. It's high sadhana to do this. This is coming from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. We didn't make any of this up. That's the mood of the Goswamis of, of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to go out and give to others. And by that, actually, we refine ourselves. How else will we overcome these various samskars except by putting them to the test and testing our resolve to go out and present Krishna consciousness makes us stronger. As Krishna was just saying, there's a way in which when we are explaining it to others, we have to explain it to ourselves also. People will challenge us all the time in various ways. And some people take, some people won't take. But even as we're seeing them not take, we may see it in ourselves as like, yeah, I'm like that too. I don't take it sometimes either. Why am I like, I, you know, how can I be critical of them if I, <laughs> if I have the same proclivity? Prem Sarovra. You're up. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Um, yeah, this reminded us of a, the, the past Live to Give campaign. Um, one time we were a call in the evening and the speaker on the other side said, I'll call police. And you're disturbing me at 8.30 p.m. Central. And this is this spam call is going forever. And I'm fed up with it. So we have to tackle it in the right way. But it reminds me of uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj's uh, comments and in the purports. Thank you, Maharaj. Yeah, you're not really preaching until somebody calls the police. And uh, that got started early on with with Shivas Thakur at the Shivasangam. Uh, you know, people called the cops almost every day, and they threatened to throw his house down the Ganga. They said, yeah, "Why don't we just get rid of get rid of his house? Stop this whole thing!" And then Mahaprabhu was was very aggressive. Actually, he said, "Now go out on the street." I mean, people already didn't like it, and then he said, "Take it out on the street." and do it everywhere on the street corners and then people escalated it they brought it up to the they took it downtown and they took it to the city hall and they said look at we're hindus and we don't like it can you do something about it it was a muslim government and they came broke the madungas said you can't do this anymore and mahaprabhu said we'll see about that we're doing it anyway and took all his people and demigods showed up, tens of thousands showed up the house of the police chief. And he just told him that, um, you know, you're a reasonable fellow. <laughs> Maybe you should reconsider. He had already visited him in the form of Lord Nishingadev and he was uh, a little more malleable at that time. So, Let's see, what, how's the order go? Is it Sukeshri and Ashraimata? I forget, is who's? Sukeshwari Mataji. Sukeshwari first Mataji in, last out or first in, first out? Or how's it go? Five oh, yeah. I think Sukeshwari Mataji first. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you're up, Sukeshwari. <laughs> Thank you, Prabhu. I was remembering when Prabhu was mentioning Prem Saro Prabhu that about maybe 10, 10, 12 years ago, we had kids um, go to an apartment very close to our Baskam Avenue temple. And um, so we knocked the door and one of the ladies that opened the door, which I, I was with three kids and we divided our, ourselves into different groups. And she said that um, I'm going to call the cops now. I don't want you to do this here. So I said, OK, if you don't want, then we're going to leave the place. She let her dog out and the dog was running behind the kids. So I told the kids, dogs are very nice. Just chant Hare Krishna, stand there, just chant. And the dog, if you don't run, the dog will not run. So then stopped and the dog was trying to go around us. And we started going, I told all the other groups, we have to leave the apartment because, you know, she doesn't like it. Well, she started taking pictures of our cars. <laughs> and then everybody, all the kids were very worried and they all got in the cars. We went to the temple, we sat down and discussed. I said, even if she has pictures of us and pictures of our cars, well, what is she going to prove? Because she can be taking pictures of cars that are parked in the parking lot. 
<laughs> or, you know, anybody walking. Well, um, at that moment, you know, we had to tell some of the kids that we don't have to worry. You know, this is something we want to do for Mahaprabhu. Mahaprabhu will surely protect us. But wherever they say we don't want, if they don't want us to do it, then we just leave the place. So it's just remembering that part. But I think that that really helped us um, realize that how um, we have to be careful as well. And especially when we are going door to door. But I have never had this situation ever come up, you know, in all these years. But that was the only only situation. I was just remembering that rule. Vayur anilam amritam atedam bashmantam shariram on kratos smarakritam smara kratos smarakritam smara. In this prayer, the devotee says, "Please remember all I've done for you." And the Prabhupada writes in the purport, "You don't have to remind Krishna; he knows what you've done for him." And especially those who have made some sacrifice like this. Uh, you're not doing it because you're breaking into people's houses. I mean, then I could understand them calling the cops. But people just get agitated because, I don't know, because they're agitated. It's natural. And uh, when you're the brunt of that for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, that goes on your permanent record. And Prabhupada said that. he When he heard of the the kind of war stories that were coming out of the airports at one point, he told us, that just as during the wartime, a simple farm boy from the Midwest would join up, enlist, and they'd put him on the front lines because they're, they're basically cannon fodder. And he'd save somebody, not just fight valiantly, but also save somebody else and come home and get a Purple Heart Award or whatever it is, Medal of Honor, and become a hometown t- hero. And he said, so if you if you enlist in the Sankirtan movement, then you'll also uh, become a hero in uh, the Sankirtan movement and be recognized by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Okay, Ashraya Madhava Prabhu and then Rupa Manjari. Uh, Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the you know, nice uh, lecture. And I was just reflect, reflecting on when you said that uh, Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur, you're talking about that Mridanga, Brihat Midanga, and the printing press. I was just reflecting that why, why mass preaching has become an almost like an emergency situation in today's world. And, and even from that time when Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur saw it, that it is, a, it is going to be emergency. We have to do mass preaching, like, you know, because... In olden days, people used to, the innocent people would normally, if they had doubts, they will go to like saintly people or they will be gathering to clarify their doubts. There were no lot of books floating around, right? And Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur saw that the atheists and they will actually teach mass in the name of literacy, just they will teach them ABC and then they will let them read whatever they can, all kinds of newspapers and abominable magazines, and they can corrupt their mind. So Bhakti Siddhanta Thakur, I think, saw that this is an emergency situation and these people have to be protected. We cannot just let them, you know, learn ABC and read all kinds of things. So they should know what is the balance in spiritual and material life. I think I have a feeling that he saw that as an emergency. So it is very important that almost every person should know that there is also a spiritual life, right? So I was just reflecting on that. I like your reflection very much, Ashraya Madhava. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Rupa Manjuri. Hare Krishna, Nandavat Pranam, Jaishal. Hare Krishna. Um, so I had one thing, which was when you were talking to um, I, Prabhu about... Uh, you know, every day, every week, every uh, month, every year, like this cycle, because this time in March every year, I redo my calendar because Gaur Purnima is coming and the new Gaurabdha is coming and I uh, sit down and I make sure that the next set of Vaishnav holidays are in my Google calendar because they're different in different places, right? And um, so I was thinking about the calendar and uh, my sister gave a talk in Columbus And somebody brought up the fact that he was a great astronomer in his student days. And actually he took the the calendar of the the Panjika and he made it the Sri Vishuddha Siddhanta Sri Chaitanya Panjika. And he, like a lot of our 
things had been lost and Bhaktivinoda Thakur had gathered them all up. And so we, you said that we have so many holidays, that we have so many holidays because we have so many Vaishnava Acharyas and on their appearance day, disappearance day, and then we have all the Akadashis and we have all these Titis and Varahada, you know, last week was like, you know, totally amazing. And Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur established, re-established the rules for calculating that and making it so that we all can observe that. And that's this like amazing tool for us to sort of every morning, like look up and think of, you know, what does Krishna want me to think about today? It's Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur made that for us. And it's like a it's like taking time and adapting that for us but he he took the work of other people who had done the astronomy and then he was very a genius himself and he was able to then combine all of those things and make it something that we can all use and it can be calculated all over the world like everybody is following that yeah thanks for reminding us of that uh how in such a practical way he did that acharyas do that so uh, expertly we barely even notice it they retrofit everything so that we can remember Krishna, <laughs> Jiva Goswami in his way of teaching Sanskrit and Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur in his way of reinterpreting what, what anybody says that seems to be detrimental against Krishna and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta bringing forward uh, way, practical ways that we can remember all the Vaishnavacharyas. That's why um, one of his, his favorite songs was the one we sang at the beginning. It's a remembrance of all the uh, great achary acharyas. Thank you very much for sharing that. Do you want to, is there another reflection you wanted to share about your Guru Maharaj and is Srila Bhakti okay? I insist yeah, upon it. Oh, okay. Well, you said something about how fresh everything is when a new person comes. And I was remembering two things. One, um, so my mother, she was born with knowing kind of in, in the Gorya family because her grandparents were Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's disciples. And because of that, she was always fascinated by whenever she met Srila Prabhupada's disciples or grand disciples or great grand, you know, she always said, tell me, how did you find Krishna? She always wanted to know like all the, you know, different stories. And so like my whole life, I kept hearing all these different stories. And I noticed whenever anyone is telling the story of how they found Krishna, it's like etched in their mind and their face changes when they, when they're reminding that. I've seen it happen with you when you talk about um, Ricky or something and the VTG in your room, Richard it's Barsa, like you're, yeah. you're, you're, you're right back there. Right. And yeah. my Guru Maharaj, Shila Guru Maharaj, Shila Bhakti Pramod Puri Maharaj, who is Shila Prabhupada's godbrother, um, he once told us a story about how in the beginning, the first few days that he was going, he was living with his mother in Kolkata and he found Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur again. He, he'd actually seen him as a child from a distance, but he found the Goryamat was established and he started going in the beginning and he was going every day before work and then going to work and then going every evening. One morning, he uh, stepped in his shoe to go to work and a, a scorpion was in his shoe and it bit his, stung him because his foot went right into the shoe, right? and black blood started coming out of his foot and his mother almost fainted crying because people die from this routinely and she you know she had lost one son she thought she was going to lose him and he she wanted to take him to the hospital and he said no and he got in a rickshaw and he's like if i'm going to die i have to go see bhakti siddhanta saraswati thakur and he wanted to go to the he went to the mat with that bleeding foot to pay his obeisances because he was like, I might die, I need to go see him. And then he sort of laughed and he, he told us, I still had that Nava Anurag, that new Anurag, um, that's so sweet. And that uh, when, and, and he, you know, when he was telling the story again, it was like, he was there, right? Obviously he's he's not bound by time. He was a Mahabhagavat. So, and we have all heard the story of Srila Bhakti, the, uh, of, Sh of Shila Prabhupada when he went to the Ultadanga, the, ro the roof, and that when he was told, you have to go, then you should pre preach it around the world. And like, it's so etched in his mind. And so that, um, that Nava of that meeting with the Guru Varga is very, like, very powerful. And it's actually very exciting to hear that about everyone. And um, I mean, if you've, if you ever, you know, when if you've ever heard all the other disciples of Shila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati talk, or if you hear them talk each of their stories, when they met him or saw him or what they really connected with him and realized he was their master. Um, it's, they're each like these little jewels of, um, and just like with, you know, with all of your godbrothers. Um, so I just was yeah. thinking about that. Actually in the, 
in the Briyat Bhagavatamrita, this uh, narration that's going on is prefaced by Gopakumar saying that actually Vaishnavas don't like to talk about their own stories. So, but actually it's because it's the best way to impart Krishna consciousness. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to do this. I'll take the liberty to do this. Thank you so much for sharing Rupa Manjuri. That was extraordinary. Ankita? Please accept my humble obeisances. Prabhuji, I think Anirud Nitaichan Prabhu uh, raised his hand before me. Okay. Anirud Nitaichan Prabhu? Uh, so, uh, accept my uh, humble obeisances. Uh, I had a question. Uh, actually, Bhaktisina Shashita mentioned that to beat the mind, I think a certain number of times, 10 times he mentioned, I don't recall exactly, in the morning and also before going to bed. Or, can you please explain a little bit more like what he actually wanted to mention uh, yes instruct us to do actually it's in this book i don't have the page number but i read it earlier today and this uh very famous admonition that you should beat your your mind with shoes in in the evening broomsticks in the morning or maybe it's vice versa take your pick uh, he equated with uh, one of the, one of the enactments was singing this bhajan that we just sang, bhajare bhajare amarn. He said, "This will, if you sing this in the morning, this will beat your your mind with shoes ten times." And so there's, uh, it, it, you know, it's really about the bhajan. We're not into uh, any uh, acrobatics or, you know anything like that, it, it has to do with engaging your mind uh, in Krishna Kata and getting getting a taste for that. When we um, take our minds away from the other engagements, hearing uh, Gramya Kata, for instance, is something that the mind becomes addicted to. So many different kinds of topics to hear in this world. In the beginning of the Bhagavatam, Shukadev Goswami mentions there are thousands and thousands of topics going on in human society, but actually uh, they're simply about the uh, materialistic endeavor, you know, sitting on an egg, waiting for it to hatch. It's going on in the bird society and the worm society everywhere. It's not a big deal. And it's, it's an entanglement. So becoming used to hearing about Krishna Kata, and if the mind doesn't want to go there, you have to live in an ashram. Your house has to be an ashram where that, that's automatic. The sound comes on when you wake up. No other sound should come in. That's beating the mind with shoes. You should have that opportunity. So the mind says, I want to hear uh, Gramya Kata, but then you turn on your uh, Krishna Kata instead, and now the mind is beat. Okay, now I don't know which order to call on anybody, but is it Ankita? Ankita. Or? Ankita. Ankita. Okay, good. We have a scorekeeper. Ankita and then Manjula Kanta, and we have Sankirtan Dasi here. Oh my God, good to see you. Hare Krishna. Okay, Ankita, go ahead. Hare Krishna, Prabhuji. Hare Krishna. Uh so um, I was actually thinking about um, how you mentioned para dukha dukhi. It was a very deeply reflective, reflecting for me because uh, I was like initially I was um, remembering about uh, how Prahlad Maharaj he his to his prayers to Lord Narsingadev he said that I have no problems of my own but because I know how to glorify your transcendental qualities but I'm thinking about these people who, who are here and enjoying with their temporary happiness, like without any knowledge of devotional service and how he was so compassionate towards these fallen co conditioned souls, even his own father and everyone. And in another context, um, we were reading Bhagavad Gita, which he was Pandit Prabhu. And in the Bhagavad Gita, it mentions that, that there are four categories of Dushkritnas and one of them is Naradamas. And Naradamas are people who are basically very socially and politically developed but no religious principles of their own and whoever lose the people who lose the chance to revive their lost relationship and the point that struck me was like oh, what's the hope for those naradamas is the mercy of devotees which again is like para dukha dukhis um, so 
someone actually came for us or came for me to deliver or to at least make me krishna consciousness so yeah para dukha dukhi is a very nice uh, yeah para dukha dukhi is a duty of every vaishnava or every man thank you so much for bringing that up that was very heartfelt and beautiful thank you so much ankita manjula kanta thank you very much maraj um you were talking in the very beginning about the kanishta adhikari and you said that the kanishta is one who will see the lord in the temple and interact with the lord but he will not be able to uh, understand the value of association or the 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 quality of the devotees that surrounding who won't be able to recognize a pure devotee and i was thinking because this month we've been reading a lot of uh, stuff on uh, propat's disciples and their interactions with shila propat and i was thinking that these disciples they came to guru first and they took association first got guru and then got to the point where they figured out what what did i take and what was the whole deal were they so do they still qualify as kanishtas in that case or were they already advanced devotees who who are continuing a process that they left from that how do we see it compared to the um, it's a very unique circumstance if you think about it uh malati prabhu ta- talks about how when Prabhupada invited some of the devotees to go out and spread Krishna consciousness and they enthusiastically ran out the door. She had to take a card with her with the mantra on it because she, <laughs> she didn't know how to say it. <laughs> Which was an indication of how fresh uh, and just full of faith the devotees were. It was a confluence of circumstances that led to that. Um, Prabhupada elevated the devotees as do, this is the um, effect of a, a pure devotee. Moonlike rays come from the heart of a devotee, as it's mentioned in the Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, and they illuminate the hearts of others. And Prabhupada really did uh, bring the devotees to the degree that they did connect to him uh, in their faith, and they did. So many of them, as you hear, uh, if you read about Shamasundar's life with Prabhupada, you know, he didn't know anything else but Prabhupada. And so they started off with, with a very advantageous position, in a very advantageous position, and sort of, they didn't have to unlearn a lot of things either. Well, of course, a lot of bad habits, but not philosophical things. They said, here's God, uh, he's shaped like, you know, here's Lord Jagannath, this is God. And they said, really? Okay, great. <laughs> <laughs> well, why didn't somebody tell us this before? And, you know, advancement comes very quickly for those who are, who embrace the uh, teachings of a pure devotee. And yeah, uh, Prabhupada engaged them immediately in going out to teach it to other people. And uh, they were summarily elevated to that position of, of uh, Majjhimadi Kari. Of course, you know, there are gradations. There are Kanishta Kanishtas, Madhyam Kanishtas, uh, Uttam Kanishtas, and many <laughs> points in between. And same with Madhyam and Uttam levels. These are more or less, you know, general categories, and they're measured in different ways. But yes, by Prabhupada's influence, the devotees got started right away in a very elevated service. That's the benefit of having pure devotee association. Sankirtan Dasi, good to have you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, please accept my obeisances. Um, when you were speaking about preaching until um, someone called the police, there were actually two instances I was thinking of where devotees were preaching and there was police participation. But sometimes the police actually work to help the devotees and not to uh, shut down the preaching. Um, so one instance was when we were having the Prabhupada festival um, along the, the Commonwealth Pier where Prabhupada first came to Boston, Massachusetts. So we had this grand Hari Nam going from the from the water all the way to Faneuil Hall. And it was such a large group of devotees with such a high vibration that when we reached into Faneuil Hall where there were thousands and thousands of people, the people actually became stunned and they just froze 
with large eyes, just like uh, the animals in Vrindavan, when they would first hear Krishna's flute, they would just become frozen. And there was actually pictures um, depicting this where you saw people just frozen, their big eyes. And then they just started wanting to join in and dance with us. And the police, um, there were several police women that started clearing people, clearing a path, and they saw it as a very important event that they wanted to come in and assist with. Um, so that was really amazing. And then another really amazing story of police participation was told by me, uh, to me by Mother Kamalini, um, who's a Prabhupada disciple. She was distributing books in, I believe it was Mexico or South America. And she was distributing books and then a crazy man came and he just pulled her by the arm and tried to drag her down the steps. And so she was like quickly running so that she didn't fall down, like running, running with the man as he was like pulling and dragging her by the arm. And the police actually came to her aid and they immediately grabbed the man and arrested him. Um, and then she actually go had to go to court and they had a hearing and um, the judge, you know, asked if she wanted to press charges and she said that she didn't want to press charges, but the man did go up to the stand and he just kept chanting over and over again. They were, he, she was distributing Krishna book and he had looked at the picture of Putana with baby Krishna where Krishna was uh, killing Putana and he that just became fixated in his mind and he couldn't think of anything else and he just started chanting over and over again they worship a thumb-sized blue boy who <laughs> sucks the breast of a goddess they worship a thumb-sized blue boy who who sucks the breast of a goddess and uh yeah that was it <laughs> <laughs> you can't make this stuff up that's what you get when you join the Sankirtan movement is nonstop exciting incidents. Thank you very much, Sankirtan Dasi. She's Thank got you. many more where that came from. Srivatsa for the close. Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Hare Krishna. I... Okay. Um yes. I was hearing I was hearing your your speech or your your talk at um Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur's Samadhi in Mayapur today morning and you were talking about how how dedicated he was to the message of Rupa Goswami and how um okay and how um he wasn't very interested in making friends and how he was just interested in speaking the truth as per Shastra and I was thinking about this and he showed so much dedication and how he expected a similar dedication out of his followers in the sense that I was reading today how he was saying that um, he expected everyone in the Gaudiya Mutt to be ready to shed 200 gallons of blood for Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And I was thinking about, wow, and I was, remi I was reminded about how you always talk about Chidrakta and how when we go on books, we're shedding that, um, we're shedding that spiritual blood for Lord Chaitanya. And um, it's such a, it's such a perfect, um, it's such a perfect way to look at things because I was thinking about as everyone was talking about book distribution and and um, as Sankirtan Matri was just talking about how um, you meet all sorts of people on book distribution and I was remembering about how I went on books with Madhav Govinda Prabhu in Santa Cruz and how we were randomly approached by someone screaming at us. He's like, you know, Krishna told that you know, Krishna told that he told Arjuna to kill his own family. How can you support this? He starts shouting at us. And I was so scared in the moment. I was so scared in the moment, but Madhav Govind, <laughs> he was so calm. <laughs> and I was thinking about this. I was like, wow, how much empowerment Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has given and how fearless like one must be to be able to spread this Sankirtan movement. And it requires that great amount of compassion. And people. And how um, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, he even wished the greatest good upon his worst enemy. And it's such a high send, it's such a high standard that he set that I'm just praying that one day I'll be able to make it there. 
Well, you were born right in the middle of it. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't have landed in on uh, ground zero more with more precision than <laughs> coming right into. Yeah, I mean, the time you were born was right when things were really picking up at ISV as far as book distribution goes. And um, so, and, you know, your wish is coming true. That's for sure. Malini. Hare Krishna Prabhu, please accept my humble obeisances Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Prabhu, there is uh, one point that you mentioned, it really stuck uh, with me that you said that how Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said that um, once you get really nice mangoes, um, you just start um, keeping them for yourself um, without distributing it to mm. others. Mm. Then the, the source might actually stop your supply. Mm. So I was just thinking that um, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu gives um, with some responsibility, he gives you some service to distribute it to others. But if we feel complacent and we keep it to ourselves and not give it to others, then we might take it for granted, but then it might be taken away from you. So this was such a revealing um, point. Thank you so much for- Yeah, it's important to remember that uh, everything we're doing is coming from Lord Chaitanya. Our, all our abilities and whatever facility we have is from Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And uh, as mentioned in the, in the Adi Lila, that the, the descendants of Advaita Acharya, some of them uh, followed properly and other ones deviated. And when they deviated, they became separated from the tree. And Prabhupada makes a, uh, you know, a real point of this about how uh, those, even their sons of Advaita Acharya, if they don't follow uh, and, and they don't stay connected in the proper way, then they dry up and the tree becomes angry at them, he says. So, you know, really we're, we're dependent on Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and um, that's the mood. I think that's really an important uh, passage there to keep for us uh, in the four. You can uh, preserve that one, Malini, and let's keep it in the four. It's really important. I want to make another point about um, the mood of preaching because Srivatsa said, you know, he wasn't worried about making enemies. And of course, we don't um, compromise, but we also don't try to make enemies. It's not that, uh, yeah, we get uh, chid rakta for a chid sharira, so <laughs> let's get more bloodshed. Actually, we try to adjust the way in which we present in such a way that people find it palatable uh, so, they can, so they can swallow it like a slippery elm. It goes right down. And I'm going to read um, from this book again, Bhaktisiddhanta Bhai Bhav, about theistic ex exhibitions. Uh, he, used, he uh, Srila Bhaktisiddhanta, put on big festivals in order to, tr to attract the masses. And, and here's just an excerpt from this that will make my point more clear. The exposition was divided into, into two sections, spiritual and secular with items collected from every part of India and the whole extravaganza covering more than one square mile. The secular division demonstrated miscellaneous departments of human endeavor, medical, educational, agricultural, arts and crafts, cattle and livestock, child welfare, athletics and amusements. Several provincial governments sent materials to be displayed. Other attractions were performances of athletic feats such as gymnastic, wrestling, boxing, sword and stick play in jujitsu. There were musical competitions, dramas, film shows, a circus, and in the words of the harmonist, other varieties of innocent amusements. Prizes, medals, and certificates were awarded to deserving exhibitors and performers. The spiritual section was even more elaborate. The museum contained figures of Vishnu and Krishna and other religious objects such as memorabilia formerly used by reputed sadhus. A book display features volumes produced by different religious sects in diverse languages and manuscripts of rare unpublished religious works. There were photos and paintings of eminent sadhus and sundry sacred places. A major draw was a huge relief map of India occupying over a third of an acre constructed 
on the ground with stone, cement, and brick and showing prominent holy places, the locations of all Gaudiya Mat branches and the roots of Sri Chaitanya and Lord Nityananda's tours. Dioramas in over 50 stalls depicted manifold religious praxis of India with emphasis, emphasis on Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. The practices of pure Vaishnavas, pseudo Vaishnavas, and other religious sects were illustrated by life size dolls set against backdrops of appropriate painted scenes, many representing incidents in the past signs of Lord Chaitanya. Another novelty for numerous visitors was the brilliant illumination of the entire grounds by recently installed electricity. electricity. So, what I'm bringing out here is his innovation in attracting people to Krishna consciousness. He had talked about uh, having hostels, youth hostels, so the, uh, youth would come and stay there. Even uh, some of them w w could apparently be non veg it's because that's the way they were at that time. But the point was, there's a funnel to bring people in. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur had talked about this also, about actually bait and switch, that you're offering what looks to be like, oh yeah, this looks like a, there's cotton candy and there's Ferris wheels and let's go, mommy. You know, and you walk in and next thing you know, <laughs> next thing you know, you're there with, um, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Lord Ananda and hearing Harinam and Kirtan and, and uh, Hari Kata. So the point is that he was an innovator and um, he brought to Radhakund, uh, some of his uh, sannyasis with shaved head and Western clothes, driving in cars, uh, which was unheard of. But he wanted to show this Yukta Vairagya principle that the principle was to uh, expand the kirtan. It's sankirtan. You do it together and you expand it unlimitedly. And that's, that is the mood of our mission. And without that, we don't have much at all. And it won't go very far at all. Neither will we. So we embrace the, the mood of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur for being part dukkha dukhi, for uh, being willing to organize ourselves in such a way that we can give Krishna Kata to others, which also includes making sure that uh, we're fully immersed ourselves. Those two, two things, as I've said many times, they're synergistic. You, they go together perfectly. And you can use up one perfectly whole, a whole lifetime doing that. Just ask some of the Sankirtan devotees here what happened to the last 15 years of their life. And they'll say, I have no idea except for one marathon to the next. You can run out your whole life on the field <laughs> like that without much problem at all. And uh, I propose that that's what Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had in mind for us. And how proud he would be of all of you as his, you know, great grandchildren, who who are just fully dedicated to uh, preaching Krishna conscious in the West, where uh, Rupa and Sanatan wanted everything to go, and where Bhaktivinoda Thakur wanted it to happen, and you're actually doing it. You know, you're sticking in. You're staying in a place that is very uncomfortable. It's very expensive too, and you're doing it. And you're making sure that uh, people get these books. So you are connected to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur and his mood. That's what I was trying to show tonight. And hopefully it came through to a certain degree. There's much, so much more to say about him and his, he and his life and his teachings. But we'll end with one of his favorite bhajans, Radha Krishna Bowl, which makes me happy because that's my favorite bhajan too. <laughs> And I'm sure he wouldn't mind us using Jamulus either. Can you give me the starting key, please?
Did we lose everybody? No more. Hold on. Don't give me the key yet. I'm going to show you up my new. Okay, go ahead. Should I do it to the key of that? Where do, do you usually start at C? Um, where do I see sharp? C sharp? Mm. That's good. We have violin. Sounds like the orchestra warming up. Give it a few plucks there, Preeky Short. Very good. Radha Krishna Bo 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 Lare Shobha Shishi Radha Krishna Bo 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 Lare Shobha Shikadiya Shobnariya Trecenecce Gornita Give me a lower key. Radha. There you go. Radha Krishna Bol 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 Rishopai. Krishna Das Che Maya Raposhe Chacho Beshe Tacho Habu Dubu Hari po po lo re mi che mai arbo she. Oh, oh, oh. 
Oh, glories to some of the devotees. Oh, glories to the assembled devotees. Oh, glories to some of the devotees. Go pray, Manandi Hari And I'll leave you with this last excerpt from the Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 4. And Prabhupada writes Personal realization does not mean that one should, out of vanity, attempt to show one's own learning by trying to surpass the previous acharya. He must have full confidence in the previous acharya. And at the same time, he must realize the subject matter so nicely that he can present the matter for the particular circumstances in a suitable manner. The original purpose of the text must be maintained. No obscure meaning should be screwed out of it, yet it should be presented in an interesting manner for the understanding of the audience, this is called realization. So Srila Bhaktisiddhanta taught us the essence, which is that keep the same message, but find the ways and means to present it so that the people could can take it and understand it and take it up. That's our duty. And that requires realization. It requires Tesham Satata Yuktanam. You have to think on your feet. You actually have to be there and f find that you're an instrument. You have to be the one who adjusts the words according to the faces of the audience and what's going on. Parampara doesn't mean you just bring in an axe and start chopping everyone up because you heard that Srila Bhakti Siddhanta had a chopping method. You have to use your own realization and sometimes common sense to integrate the message into a particular audience so that it goes in. And the example, one example I gave tonight was the theistic exhibition. It's, and it, it's indicative of the way that Srila Bhaktisiddhanta thought is find a way that people who are only attracted to cotton candy and Ferris wheels will gradually be pulled in to hearing Hari Kata and Kirtan. And we have to be expert in doing that in order to be actual followers of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. We have to be essence seekers. We're not taking just the form. Oh yeah, we're in a religion, fine, great. The, the, the brick and mortar is not so important. We have to have it to manage the results because people have to have some place to go. But the main thing is the main thing and it will always be the main thing and it's being able to expertly inject the holy name into the lives of people and holding their hand uh, while they're doing it so they can get over the nightmare they're in right now, which is uh, quite distressing. And they, everyone needs our help. And we all need our help too. So let's help, help ourselves, help each other, and try to help the world. And that will please Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. Om Tat Sat. Gor Premanane Haribo. Thanks to the Jamulas Band for showing up on a Wednesday night. And uh, thank you, everybody else. 
for staying up into the wee hours of the night, especially you, Sankirtan Dasi, out on the East Coast and others who may be out there. Yes, Chicago, you have Prem Sarovra, Shruti Priya, uh, some staying up into uh, almost tomorrow just to hear Krishna Kata. Vantra Kopata Rishja, Kripa Sindhabe, Vachapati Tanam, Pavani Vyo, Vaishnabe, Vyo, Can everyone please unmute and say Hare Krishna? Hare Krishna. 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 Hare